So the GRADE system, what it stands for is Grading of Recommendations Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And it's a system that's uh, used to grade or rate the quality of evidence out there and also the strength of recommendations specifically for clinical guidelines. And so uh, the GRADE system is becoming a worldwide standard and it's been used in many journals around the world including the BMJ and uh, the World Health Organization and uh, the Cochrane Collaboration. So uh, prior to the grade rating system, there were uh, many, many systems, and um, it, the grade system came out in about 2000, and uh, it came out because of the need to have a system that was very sensible, transparent, and very user-friendly. And um, I certainly can attest to that. We certainly, we're putting out s systematic guidelines now for spinal cord injury, and we um, unfortunately did not use the grade system, and it certainly added a lot of um, of, uh, of additional time to reaching a consensus about a lot of our uh, recommendations. So what are the definitions in, in, um, in terms of utilizing the grade? Well, quality evidence um, indicates the extent to which one can be confident that the estimate is correct. And then in terms of what strength of recommendation is, is that it indicates the extent to which um, one can be confident that if you adhere to a treatment, that uh, you'll do more good than harm. So in terms of quality of evidence, which is the first part of the grade system, it's uh, divided into four different areas, uh, high, moderate, low, and very low. And um, quality of evidence is important, as we know, because failure to consider good advice um, can lead to bad problems. And likewise, adhering to bad sort of quality of evidence can lead to uh, misguided recommendations. And this is George Bush here talking about the economy. Um, so better quality evidence will ultimately provide better estimates and better confidence in the estimate. So what, what are the different subtypes? What do they refer to? So high quality of evidence is that uh, you can look at it at further research is very unlikely to change our confidence in the estimate of the effect. And then moderate types of evidence um, are, is defined as further research is likely to have an important impact on the confidence of the estimate, and it may change the estimate. And then we get sort of into the low qualities, which is where further research is very likely to change our, um, the estimate and the confidence we have, and very low is where any estimate of the effect is very uncertain. So it really has to do with how certain and confident we are in, in what we think the, the solution is to, to, to what we're interested in. So how do we determine the quality of evidence? And there's a number of steps, but the first one goes into looking at sort of the studies that are being used to answer the question at hand and looking at the study design. So randomized trials, um, we st it, it, you automatically get a high level of quality to start off with non-experimental studies such as cohorts and case control trials um, begin with a very low level of quality of evidence um, and case series is is even lower very low I should say low and very low and then there's different factors that you can then adjust for um, making it more negative or more positive and so there's factors that can negatively influence the quality rating score and so if you have let's say a randomized trial looking at nailing versus plating, let's say, and um, um, there's no blinding in that randomized trial. Certainly that can have a serious limitation in terms of study quality. Um, and other factors are like um, uncertainty of the directness. So, for example, if you're looking at uh, use of drugs in, in, a, in a question and, and the drugs in, in your trials that you're reviewing are, are in the same class, but they're not exactly quite what you're interested in, certainly that detracts from the quality of evidence that you're utilizing. In addition, other factors like sparse data, so you have one randomized trial, or the, the data is very imprecise where those confidence intervals are very wide, they cross that relative risk of one, um, certainly that detracts from that quality. If you have a lot of inconsistencies, so you have a pool of randomized trials and they're all telling a little bit different stories in terms of what the potential estimates may be, again, that can negatively affect the, your quality rating. 
and certainly any biases, especially publication biases where let's say you know that a study has been done but it was negative and as a result it wasn't published, certainly that could affect the, the quality rating score. Now similarly there's things that could improve the quality score. So if um, for example, if there's a prospective cohort study looking at a group of patients who've been treated non-operatively for severe hip osteoarthritis versus a group that went, underwent total hip arthroplasty, you know, although it starts out with a low evidence rating, um, and the, but the treatment effect is extremely large, you can go up one or two levels in terms of quality of evidence. And certainly if you, if you have a question and you see a dose response gradient or if uh, you have an unadjusted effect and if you throw in all your confounders uh, to adjust for the, the confounding factors and it reduces the effect, certainly those are all um, factors that can positively influence your quality score. So um, for example, this, uh, this is the, an example court study starts with low quality and then you can move upwards because there's a significant treatment effect. So this is an example of a sheet that uh, you may use to, um, if you're undergoing or developing guidelines um, in, and uh, clearly outlining sort of for a given outcome um, sort of uh, the various factors that may decrease the evidence, the quality of evidence for, the, for that outcome measure. Now the Getting into the second part of the grade rating system is the rating strength of recommendation. And so um, the grade rating system has made that easy. It's either strong or weak. And um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, the difficulty comes in sometimes picking which, which one it is. Um, and so um, a strong recommendation is, is one where there's confidence that the desirable effects of adhering to that recommendation will um, outweigh the undesirable effects. And then um, weak recommendations are not that they're bad recommendation, but it's that the desirable effects probably still outweigh the undesirable, but you're not as confident about that. So again, it's a sort of about the confidence of, of, of what your recommendation is about. And so there's various implications when you have a strong recommendation and that when it's published, um, and it has consequences for the patient, for the clinician, and also policymakers. So for the patient, um, an implication of a strong recommendation is that for most people who are probably informed, you know, they would probably want the recommended treatment, and a very small percentage would not. And so for a clinician who's treating patients, if there's a strong recommendation for a treatment, most of the patients who, who match that, who are, are part of that, um, treatment guideline should have received that treatment. And for policymakers, that means that the recommendation should be adopted as policy. In, in contrast, when there's a weak recommendation, um, there's more uncertainty about whether or not this is a good thing. So, um, so for the patient, what that means is that uh, most people would probably want it, but then there's going to be a lot of people who, do, who don't want that treatment. And for the clinician, when there's a weak recommendation that's put out there, um, there probably will be different choices that will be appropriate for different types of people. And for policymakers, what this means for a weak recommendation is that um, it'll probably require debate before it's incorporated into healthcare policy. And there's different factors, that, like the factors for quality of evidence. There, there are factors that can affect recommendation ratings and um, the first is the balance between desirable and undesirable consequences. So every recommendation that is out there has a trade-off between both positive and negative aspects. And the greater that difference there, there is, um, the higher the likelihood that a strong recommendation is, is needed. The second factor is quality of evidence. So obviously the higher the quality, the more confident you are in, in, in the evidence that, that you're being presented and the higher uh, likelihood that a strong recommendation is warranted. In addition, there's values and preferences. So we, we practice medicine in, in, a, in a society where there's a wide variety potentially of values and preferences. And uh, the more values and preferences there are for your given problem, the higher likelihood that a weak recommendation is warranted just because there may be uh, 
um, it may not suit everyone with that particular issue. And then the last factor that determines or affects how recommendations are rated is the cost and, and the amount of resources that are needed. So um, the higher the costs, unfortunately, for a recommendation, typically that reduces the likelihood of a recommendation being given a strong recommendation by policy groups. So this is an exam graphical illustration of the grade rating system. So on the top part, it's the quality of evidence. And it could be high, moderate, low, or very low. Um, and, and then the strength of the recommendation, it could either be strong or weak, either for the intervention that you're interested in or against the intervention. So um, now the grade system, uh, that was just an overview of, of what the grade system means. But overall, there's, um, there's a whole other s um, steps prior to using the grade system. And, and usually this is done um, by committees. And so there's usually a group or organization that wants to identify or put out a set of guidelines or recommendations. And, and so the first part is to prioritize the problems at hand. And then um, there's usually a selection of a panel involved. And um, the, the members of the panel are chosen so that they represent the various stakeholders. And then, and then that group then decides on sort of a group process on how they, they'll decide agreement to, to support these recommendations and what's considered good evidence, low evidence, et cetera. And there's different methods of coming to that in a formal setting. So they're, they're called Delphi methods, nominal method of agreement, different types of voting, et cetera. And then after that, there's a systematic review. So, and, and you know, the Cochrane collaboration is a good example where they've done a lot of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And basically critically identify and critically appraise the literature for, for the various outcomes that are critical for making this decision. And then for each of the outcomes identified from the systematic review, then the grade rating system is applied. Um, and so following that, you then implement the recommendation and identify um, the changes that have occurred.